8, verse number 14 is where we're going to take our text today. So if you would stand with me for the reading of the Word, Romans chapter 8, verse 14. You can turn in your Bible. You can look up there at the screen. It'll be on there as well. We find here Romans chapter 8 is one of my many favorites of verses of chapters in the Bible. There's so much to be learned uh, from Romans chapter 8. Really, Romans chapter 8. If you want some good Bible study uh, this week, just take and start around Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, and go through chapter 8. There is so much to, to grasp and to pull out of those chapters on being a Christian and what it is. Paul is talking here in these chapters about even his struggle of where he needs to be and where he wants to be and desires to be in the reality of where he is at. But right here in the, the heart of Romans chapter 8, we find uh, verse 14 that really just uh, sums it up for us. He says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Father, I love you today. I thank you for the Word of God. I thank you for the powerful impact of the Word of God upon my life and upon the life of each believer here today. And I pray, Lamb of God, that you would just let your sweet anointing fill this place. Let the Holy Ghost and fire burn within our hearts. And I pray, Lamb of God, that the message will find that place in our hearts that it needs to find and we can be better equipped to serve you and to live for you. Help us to realize what we've got on board as spirit-filled believers. And Lord God, to know that you want to do great things in us and through us. I know I desire your anointing to preach today, and I believe each believer here today would say, Lord, I desire your anointing to receive the word that I may be made better for the service of the Lord. And we just pray, God, that it will do so in our hearts and lives. Once again, we pray for traveling mercies for all of those traveling this week and in the weeks to come over the summer vacation time. And we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. For as many that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. When we think about Israel and we think of the story of Israel and, and we talked last week about how they left Egyptian bondage and uh, it, was, it was a task, it was a, it was a process that they had to go through to leave the Egy Egyptian bondage. But it was a process that did not uh, take years. It just took but a moment of uh, convincing Moses, convincing Pharaoh to let them go. And, and though there may have been some struggle there, they ultimately got out of Egypt. But what we talked about uh, last week was not so much the struggle for them to get out of Egypt, but the struggle to get Egypt out of them. And it's the same way for us. Uh, and, and many of us who, who have, may have came to the Lord late in life, it may even be more difficult because we get so much of the world's ideas and all the thought process of the world, so much uh, of Egypt in our heart and our mind. Uh, and it's a wonderful thing to say, I've come out of the world. Uh, but Scripture goes on to say we've got to do come, more than come out of the world. He said, come out from the world and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Uh, so we, it's important that we too, uh, on this journey, to our promised land uh, that we get Egypt out of us. And how do we do that? By letting the Spirit uh, not only be born again of the Spirit, but being filled with the Spirit uh, and then being led of the Spirit. So that story of Israel's journey to the promised land is really a story of spiritual leadership. Uh, we've come out from Egypt and we've stepped out into uh, a wilderness maybe, a place uh, on a journey to get to where God wants us to be, uh, but we don't know the way. Way. Uh, we don't know what to do, but they didn't know what to do as they was uh, heading for that promised land. But was a spirit uh, came and was given to them as you study uh, that that time when they came out of Egypt, heading for the promised land and their wilderness journey there. Uh, that God gave them a form, the spirit in the form of a fire by night and a cloud by day. And here's where here were their instructions: move when the cloud moves and stop. When the cloud stops. If you take a note, you might want to write that down this morning. It'll be helpful to you in the days to come. Move when the Spirit moves, right? Move when the cloud moves and move and stay and stop when the cloud stops. 
We know that the Spirit never stops, but there is a time uh, that God tells us to stand still and see that I am the Lord. Uh, so as Israel obeyed God, what did they find? Uh, uh, they not only ultimately, uh, a few of them made it all the way to the promised land, but during uh, those times, even in a wilderness, even in this journey, even what seemed to be a struggle at times, uh, as long as they obeyed and was Spirit-led, they, uh, as they obeyed, they found the rich blessings of God uh, was always available. They had quail uh, that they didn't have to look for. They had manna that just appeared daily. Their provisions were met by God. And so understanding that, God gave instructions uh, to Moses, their great leader. Uh, and the reason that they were able to uh, experience these blessings of God uh, is this great man of God by the name of Moses uh, was instructed to never go ahead of the cloud, uh, but never uh, lag behind the cloud. Uh, can I tell you this morning, uh, never go ahead of the Spirit, uh, but never lag behind the Spirit. Uh, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, uh, and he delighteth in his way. Uh, the only way that we can be Spirit-led uh, is if we're born again of the Spirit. Uh, we must be filled with the Spirit, uh, and we must walk step in step with the Spirit of God uh, to say each day, Lord, uh, what would you have me to do? Where would you have me to go? Uh, what would you have me to say? Uh, too many people wanting to do their own thing uh, and add Jesus to it. It doesn't work that way. Uh, we've got to be spirit led uh, Moses understood that uh, he didn't take those people out in front of the cloud uh, he didn't take those people lagging behind the cloud uh, he said we move when the cloud moves so it's, no, it's worth noting this morning that the spirit never moved about looking for manna spirit never had to look for manna the Spirit never uh, took them to say uh, let me take you to a place that already has provision. Now they were ultimately going to a, a land, Canaan, uh, that flowed with milk and honey, but there was also giants in the land. Uh, but that's a different message. Uh, but he said here, understanding, as we see this, that, uh, that the Spirit never went looking for manna, but the manna always fell where the Spirit was. The, the cloud was there and the Spirit was there and the manna came from that provision of God. So that lets us know something about God. Let's just know that every provision of God for us as his people is not found in things. It's not found in possessions. It's not found uh, in signs and wonders. Listen, true believers don't run after signs and wonders. We're not running across town or to another state because, uh, oh, we hear, man, there's signs and wonders going on there. Listen, you don't have to waste gas money to go running uh, looking for signs and wonders. Uh, he said simply, signs and wonders follow those who believe. Uh, we don't have to go running for a great revival uh, in New York City or California or Tennessee. It's wonderful to gather uh, in those settings. Uh, but God said wherever the Spirit is, uh, there is revival. Bible, signs and wonders, uh, follow those uh, that believe. Uh, so we have to understand that uh, and understand that, that spirit uh, is coming from God uh, to his people. So if we as the church uh, could just learn this simple lesson, if we're led by the spirit, uh, that we can live under an open heaven uh, at all times. What does that mean? Uh, if we're led by the spirit, uh, that means that the blessings of God never run out. And we can say, he's been good to me. Uh, oh, we may face circumstances. Uh, we may face trials. There may be things that break our hearts uh, and tear us apart on the physical uh, and the emotional side. Uh, but we understand uh, that many are the afflictions of the righteous, uh, but the Spirit delivers us from them all. Uh, it's only those who are led by the Spirit uh, that understands that we can live there uh, under that open heaven at all times. What does that mean? In the good times, I've got joy. In the bad times, I've got joy. With tears in my eyes, I've still got joy. How is that possible, Pastor? Because the joy of the Lord is my strength. He's my peace and he's my help and he's my hope at all times. Understanding something about our success as Christians, it depends upon us being led by the Spirit. I mentioned this earlier about Paul's writing to Timothy. He wrote two epistles to Timothy. And in those 
letters that he wrote to young Timothy, this young pastor, he, he warned of a problem that would come in the last day church. He was warning Timothy of a problem that would happen many years down the road. So when Timothy read it, he knew it was a problem that was coming. But as we read it, we find it's a problem that is here among us right now, that we're living in this moment. He said that this, this would be the, the church, in essence, is what he was saying. There would be a church, would be a form, with no power. He said it like this to Timothy. He said that they would have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. People in, in the early church, they couldn't begin to fathom such as that. Even in the early history of the American church, uh, in the Pentecostal church, they couldn't fathom uh, that there would be churches that would gather with such formality and forms, but no power. But Paul said it would happen. He told Timothy it would, and we see it being lived out among us on a daily basis. What he was saying is the church would no longer be a living organism. That's what God intended it for to be, a living organism led by the Holy Ghost. He was telling Timothy, he said, there's going to come a time uh, that they're not going to be spirit-led, but they're going to be led by men. They're going to follow uh, the, the doctrines and the leadership uh, of what man tells them to do. What he was telling him uh, is pastors would become CEOs. He, would, he was telling them that it would be more about the business aspect. It would be more about the, the, the people, uh, uh, seeker-friendly, uh, what keeps people happy. Uh, he said that there would be men uh, with itching ears. Uh, and he just went on to tell, what is he telling young Timothy? Uh, he said, there's coming a day that men are just going to preach what people want to hear, uh, nothing more and nothing less. Uh, but also, what did he tell Timothy? He said, from such turn away. Uh, he said, don't be led by that kind of, uh, don't be led by that kind of example. Uh, and Timothy, don't be that kind of leader. He said, be the kind of leader that's led by the Spirit uh, that says, follow me as I follow Christ. Uh, follow me as I follow the steps uh, of the Spirit. Uh, and so understand that if we want the power of God uh, in our day, we're going to have to restore this message uh, of Pentecost. We're going to have to restore uh, this message of being spiritually uh, led uh, by the Holy Ghost. Uh, understanding that the things of God are spiritually discerned. Uh, flesh cannot comprehend the things of the spirit carnal cannot grasp it the carnal mind can never grasp the deep things of God this isn't just the book that you pick up and that you read and that you get some knowledge out of on the carnal side this book is alive it's the only book that you will read that knows your thoughts that knows the intents of your heart have you ever read a book before that read you? This book reads you. Why is it? Because it is the living Word of God. It is the living Word of God. And the only way that it can be uh, discerned is through the Spirit. Man cannot come to Christ uh, at all except the Spirit draw them. I, I understand that there's a great desire to fill up church houses. I get that. I, I understand that. Uh, but there are so many books that are written. There's so many uh, methods that are placed out uh, to give you the step-by-step, -step, cut and dry, this is how you win people to Christ. Uh, and they, they tell you uh, uh, soul-winning tools, and they have seminars and they have all of these things. Uh, listen, we don't need another seminar to teach us how to lead people to Christ. Uh, we don't need another book uh, to teach us how to win somebody to Christ. Uh, be understand that the first step uh, is if the Spirit's not drawing them, uh, they're not coming. If the Spirit's not dealing with them, uh, they're not coming. And if we uh, draw them in, pat them on the back, shake their hand, uh, and tell them they're saved when they've not been saved, uh, we'll answer for that. There's only one uh, who can save, and his name uh, is Jesus. We have to pray, uh, Lord, let the convicting power of the Holy Ghost uh, draw them in. Man cannot come to Christ uh, and let, except the Spirit draw them uh, and understand uh, that these ways of doing it through the flesh will not work because the spirit never draws flesh spirit never draws flesh we can't use fleshly means to win people to christ we need to get in the spirit filled with the spirit and led by the spirit we find this great example with noah building the ark he, he's given us a great example of this truth the same god 
that led Noah to build that ark as Noah was somebody I read something the other day said I wonder if they thought Noah building the ark was a conspiracy theory until it started to rain they never heard or seen rain before Noah's out there building this this big massive boat in his front yard now, now you think about that you ride past your neighbor's house and they're building this monstrosity anybody ever been to to the ark up in Kentucky they've got it's huge so Noah had a bigger yard than I have. So he's building this huge ark there in his yard. God tells him all the dimensions and how to lay it out. God is very specific in how to do it. And he is laying it out and, and how it will work for, for what God was t- intending to do. Uh, I don't even believe that Noah really fully understood everything that God intended there. That He just did uh, that that God said and built that ark. And they're looking at him. They're laughing at him. And they're uh, questioning what he is doing. But what does he do in all of that? He just keeps building the ark. He just keeps building the ark. And so, uh, no, but Noah understood something. He understood that the same God that led him to build that ark was the same God that was going to do the rest, which would lead the animals abroad to the ark when it was finished. I don't read in my Bible that after Noah got through finishing the ark that uh, him and his sons got on uh, camels or horses and went out and rounded up all of the animals. Do you read that? No, it just says they came. They came. So Noah did something here. He knew and understood that if he would just follow uh, the leading of the Spirit and build the ark, uh, that God would do the rest. Uh, So Noah demonstrated what true faith is uh, in in this great story found early in the Bible. It's knowing what God wants you to do and doing it. Understanding something, uh, that Noah didn't say, well, those dimensions sound pretty good, Lord, uh, but I really think these dimensions. Uh, God gave the min- dimensions, God gave the pitch, God gave the instructions, uh, and Noah just simply done. Too many times uh, we begin to say, but God, we, we think we have this infinite knowledge, uh, and, and in my experience, uh, and the way that I have figured this thing, uh, Lord, I know that you spoke to me last week uh, and told me to step out, uh, but since that time, Lord, I pulled out a piece of paper and started doing the math, and it's not going to add up. No one ever did that. God said, build an ark, and these are the dimensions to build the ark, so he got the work. He got to work. And so when he did that, he shows us this example of what true faith is all about, knowing what God wants you to do and doing it. Uh, And you know what that does? It leaves the results up to God. Uh, How many is willing to have that kind of faith to say, I know what God told me to do, uh, and I'm just going to do it. Uh, And my success does not depend uh, on uh, what I can bring of it, but my success brings uh, what God brings out of what I do in obedience to his voice. Uh, Noah set that example, but too many today uh, don't want to do that. Uh, but if we could follow this example and say, I'm just going to do what God says do, and I'm going to leave the results up to him. We understand that something here that Jesus taught this very same thing. He taught us that every need would be met when we learn to be controlled by the Spirit. We, we read it last week, Matthew 6 and 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, that all these things shall be added unto you. So understand something, that Jesus is that ark. He's that ark of safety. He is the only refuge that we're going to have when the storm comes. There was a great storm coming. People didn't realize it. Uh, uh, Noah may not have fully realized what was coming, but he knew uh, that he had to do what God was telling him to do. Uh, So we've got to understand that today, that we too uh, have to understand that we need to be doing what God says to do uh, because there's a storm coming, and there's the the only ark of safety is being led by the Spirit uh, and being in harmony with the Spirit and being in the center of His will. Uh, So we as the body, the church as the body, uh, we're in this world, but we've got to understand understand something we're not of this world we're in the world but we cannot afford to be of this world Uh, so our life is spiritual uh, and we cannot operate in the carnal realm a church that is operating uh, in the carnal realm is a church that's in trouble. Uh, we've got to be led by the Spirit. Uh, and so when we begin to reduce ourselves uh, to the flesh, uh, we're just limited to what can happen in the physical. 
When, when we uh, just go by uh, our dependence uh, upon how many the degrees that we have and how much knowledge we have uh, and how much ability we have, uh, oh, the great uh, prophet, he's known as the minor prophet, but he said this uh, through the Spirit of the Lord. He said, it's not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, and many people are trying to do it by their might, their ability, their power, uh, and all of that. I understand this morning uh, that we have God given talents and abilities uh, but understanding too that we can take God given talents and abilities uh, and use them for the wrong thing uh, if we're not led by the spirit in those areas you can think you can go and you can listen and you can interview some great singers of this world and you know where they'll tell you they started on the platform in a choir singing specials God-given talents and abilities, but they're not using it for the glory of God. Every now and then, they'll, they'll sing a God song to make themselves feel better or go on a spiritual broadcast to try to make themselves or give a spiritual post, but they've not being spirit-led. If they were being spirit-led, they would not be in the path that they're in. So our life is spiritual, and we cannot operate in any other realm. We, we can't reduce ourselves to that because we'll be limited in the Spirit to understand that let the Holy Ghost, let the Spirit of God have His way in our lives. But under, or also, on the other hand, we've got to realize this, that we as the church, controlled by the Spirit, there is no boundaries. I remember several years ago, standing on the pulpit there at Howard Road, that I, I, I declared what the Lord declared to me in prayer. He said, it's time to expand your boundaries. He said, to expand your tent posts. We didn't have a tent big enough to expand our tent posts, is what the flesh wanted to tell God. We wanted to tell God, it won't do me any good to take my post out further because I don't have enough tent to cover it. But what God is saying, if you expand your tent post, I'll provide the tent. If you will expand your boundaries, what is he saying? He's saying, believe in accordance to my word. Believe by my spirit. Walk in my spirit. Uh, and so we can reduce ourselves to what we can do and what we can accomplish, uh, what the checkbook says and uh, everything else. Uh, but when we begin to know that God is doing the leading, uh, we also know that God will do the providing. Uh, if God is directing, he will make a way where there seems to be no way. Uh, if he tells Noah to build an ark for all of these animals, uh, God God will send the animals. Uh, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying if God is working on your end, uh, don't worry about the other end. God's working on the other end. Uh, he's making a way where there seems to be no way. Well, how can he do that? Because he's God. Uh, and understanding uh, that he can do exceeding abundantly above all. Uh, so we begin to understand that the Holy Ghost tears away every barrier uh, and allows us as the Spirit-led church once again uh, to live under an open heaven. Uh, what does that even mean, uh, to live under an open heaven. It means that we're not succumbed or limited to fleshly things. We're not put in a place that we have to stay within the realm of this. We're not tied down. We're not beat down. We're not defeated. We're not the victim. But understanding that we are a victorious people that must live in victory and walk in victory. And how do we do that? By the leading of the Spirit of God. Understand something about about the Spirit-led church. Uh, for us to be that place, uh, we have to understand what the Word of God says about who the one is that leading us. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 1, 21, that Christ is our example. He's the firstborn of a new creation. 1 John 4 and 17 tells us that He is, and so are we in this world. Jesus said this of Himself in John 14, 16. He said, I am the way. So we must live just like he lived. Christ, the king, right? Christ, the second person of the Godhead. We, we know all the deity of Christ, but remember, he was Jesus the man. Remember what the writer of Hebrews said about him? He was at all points tempted as you and I. Meaning he had the same opportunities that you and I have to sin, but he didn't do it. So many people tell you today, well, you can't live without sin. You can't go a day without sinning. Well, our example tells us otherwise. 
Our example tells us otherwise, and he tells us the only way that we can do it. He says, be ye perfect as I am perfect. Uh, and what, what does that even mean to us today? Uh, he's saying, we say, well, I sin, I fall short. Uh, well, what Jesus is saying, if we will grow up uh, spiritually, if we'll be led by the Spirit and not by the flesh, uh, if we will be uh, born again of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit, and led by the Spirit, uh, we too can tell the devil, no, I'm not going to do that. Uh, no, we're going to be like Joseph and say, I can't do this uh, great sin in the face of my God. Uh, to know that there is something more important to me than that. I, I'm going to live like Christ lived. How did Christ live? Well, John 12, 49 tells us this is what he said of himself. He said, For I have not spoken of myself, but for the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment that I should say and what I should speak. Have you ever been in a situation or a circumstance that you felt like you needed to defend yourself? Just, just wave at me if you've been. I've been there. You felt like you needed to defend yourself? And so I, I need to, to speak. On, I am speaking in my behalf. You ever been there? And there, there's been times that uh, we may have said, had confidence to say, uh, maybe uh, an instance, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, that it does not tell us which one spoke up, but it says that they spoke up, uh, but it wasn't in defense of their self. Their defense was in God. But have you ever been in those moments that you, you say, I believe I can speak for all of us? You ever been there? A group of, I, I think that I can speak for all of us. And the ones that didn't want to talk just went, uh-huh. Yeah, what he said, or yeah, what she said. And so what Jesus is saying here uh, in John 12 and 49, uh, he says, him uh, being the second person of the Godhead, he's speaking as Jesus the man, uh, Mary's boy, uh, 100% flesh. Uh, he said, listen, I've not spoken of myself, uh, but he is saying here, I'm not talking about on the carnal side, the flesh side. Uh, he said, I'm not talking to you uh, as on, on Mary's side, but I'm talking to you uh, on my father's side. He said, I can't afford to respond uh, even like Joseph may respond or like Mary uh, would have uh, responded. Uh, but he said, my response has to be of that uh, of the Father uh, because Mary didn't send me. Uh, my Father sent me. So he said, uh, he, we, he gave me a commandment that I should say and what I should speak. So even though he put on this house of flesh and he lived here on earth, he could still hear what the Father was speaking to him. Even though he had on the house of flesh, Jesus still knew what was going on in heaven. Isn't it wonderful when you're away from home to stay in contact with home? That, that's important. When, when I traveled over to the Philippines, I, I thank God for, for technology. I paid extra for the technology to be able to stay connected with what was going on at home. I could look into the screen of my iPad or my cell phone uh, and still be able to see into my house to still be able to see my wife's face and my kids' faces. That was important to me when I was away from home. But you know, when Jesus was here, he didn't have an iPad. He, he didn't have a cell phone. Uh, but some way, somehow, he could still see what was going on in heaven. How is that? Uh, well, he told us in the Lord's Prayer how that is. Uh, he said, Lord, let thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And how is that done? Uh, through his people, through his vessels, uh, and understanding uh, that Jesus understood that well. And if we could grasp hold of that, uh, that though we're living here on this earth, uh, how was this that Jesus the man uh, was at all times uh, led by the Spirit? Uh, if you and I are going to live here uh, as strangers and pilgrims on this earth, uh, listen, we're going to give into the world system if we don't know what's going on in heaven. If our focus is not on the Father's will, uh, we're going to give in to America's will. We're going to give in to the politician's will. We're going to give in to our personal will. That's the importance of prayer. Thy will be done. So Jesus set the example. He said, the only way that you're going to make it, the only way that you're going to get to where you need to go, that ultimate destination, uh, as we go from glory to glory, uh, the glorious reality of being saved, it don't stop there. There's a path uh, that takes us to glory. Uh, and the Father is saying, I've gone to prepare a, a place for you. Uh, and Jesus is saying that, that where I am, there you may be also. Uh, but the only way that we're going to get there uh, is we, just like Jesus the man, uh, we have 
have to be at all times led by the Spirit of God. Uh, We must operate on that same plane uh, by being led by the Holy Ghost. He said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost. And so by the Spirit, we know God's will. And by the same Spirit, how many of those this morning, there's one thing to know. Your kids know what to do, right? Parents that have kids just wave at me. You told them what to do, right? They know what to do, but do they always do it? Not mine. Not me. I didn't. I didn't always do what I was supposed to do. But when it came down to mom and dad for punishment time, I had to answer the question, on you knew you weren't supposed to do that. Yeah, I knew. Then that dreaded, well, why did you do it? Why did you do it? I get on to Gracie for giving the same answer that I gave. Hello, no. Right? You knew, but you don't know. And so here it is uh, that we are being uh, in this place to understand something. Uh, We know the will of God. Uh, And so the only way that we can uh, do more than just know the will of God, uh, understand something, the flesh will not do the will of God. No matter how much knowledge you have of the Bible up here on what to know what to do, the flesh is going to refuse to do it. Because we're talking about the same flesh that will read something that says, don't touch, this is hot. What are they going to do? I don't believe it's hot. Wet paint. Oh, yeah. That's who we're talking about. We're talking about this this house of flesh that we carry around that can know, know what the instruction says, but think they're smarter than the instructions. And we have a lot of screws left over for some reason. But he said by that same spirit that we know, we just simply do it. I think of Mary. There, what we know is used in weddings often. That first miracle at Galilee. How many remembers Jesus' first miracles? What was it? Turn water into wine, right? And so they had run out of wine at that wedding feast, and Mary calls Jesus over and says, you've got to do something about this. And what does Jesus say? He says, my time's not yet come. We don't know what all that means, but, but that's what he told her. And he said, she said, basically, I'm your mama. And so the instructions were given. She said, I need you to do something about it. She didn't have any idea what he would do about it, but you need to do something about it. But this is the part I wanted to get to. And she looks at the servants, and she says this, whatever he says do, do it. Those servants knew what they did. They brought barrels of water. So all they did is, I don't know why I'm doing this. They're help me with this barrel, driving. They're carrying this barrel, and you know what they're talking back and forth? I don't know what he's going to do with a bunch of water. We need more wine. So there may have been that discussion going on as they're bringing in the barrels, but what are we doing? And one of them might have spoke up, whatever he says, do. Whatever he says, do. You you ever feel that, that that you're doing things that God told you to do, and flesh says, what are we doing? See, the flesh likes to talk a lot. Whether you're shy, backwards, indifference, I, I am one of the shyest people you'd ever meet, but my flesh likes to talk to me a lot. My flesh likes to question God a lot. What are you doing? What are you doing? And too many times uh, we let the flesh keep on talking. We let the flesh keep on doubting. We let the flesh continue uh, to not only plant the seed but grow the tree. We let the flesh, as I was talking about here uh, a couple of services ago, but keep building that wall. And you know what the devil does, as I said a couple weeks ago? He just keeps handing you the brick. You want to build a wall? You make it my job easy. I'll just hand you the brick to do it. And so the flesh has all of these doubts. But what if we talk back to the flesh? What are you doing? Whatever the Spirit says to do. Why are you doing this? Because God told me to. Always work for Mama. Right? Do this. Why? Because I said so. 
So it should be that way with the Father. Why are you doing that? People will look at you and say, why are you doing that? Why do you worship that way? Why do you go to church three times a week? Why do you feel the need to be there every time the doors are open? Why do you do this? And why do you do that? And we just simply say, because God told me to. Because His Spirit says so. That's the way God has led me to do it. Listen, that question or that answer will never be good enough for the world. But it should be good enough for the church. Understand, that answer will never suffice flesh. But it should suffice the spirit uh, to say whatever he says do that's what I'm going to do because that's the example that Jesus said and when we are spirit led we break through every barrier of the flesh and we tear down that wall that flesh has worked so hard to build up and we begin to operate in that spiritual realm because they did what Jesus said do that leader of that feast takes that and said man you saved the best for last those guys were just as amazed as he is because they knew what they put in the barrel, right? When the power of God falls and works miracles in a mighty way, there's been many times I've seen the hand of God moving. I was just as surprised as everybody else. I was as surprised as my kids are on Christmas morning when they open up their gifts to know uh, I I know uh, what happened. I know uh, what was leading up to that. uh, But I also know it was just something simple. Uh, It was just something uh, that that seemed to be insignificant. But I just did what God said do, uh, and it became a miracle. It became a miracle. So who's the miracle worker? He is. But how does he work miracles? Uh, By our obedience. We're here for a reason. We're here for a purpose. You're important in this thing. You're important in this operation to know that God has sent and he has put in place and he has orchestrated this. Jesus is no longer walking here. He's at the right hand of the Father. But he said, I've sent the Holy Ghost, the promise of the Father to do what? To fill a group of individuals called the church. But what did Paul say about the church? That we are now the body of Christ. And how can we uh, be the body of Christ if we don't operate uh, like he operates? Uh, If we don't live under an open heaven, uh, if we're not uh, uh, being led by the Spirit of God, uh, Jesus was all points tempted as you and I, uh, but yet he said, Father, what would you have me to do? Remember his prayer on the carnal side, let this cup pass from me. But he didn't stop there. Not my will, but thy will be done. There's going to be times that you're going to say, let this pass from me. I don't want to do this, God. But we must follow the leading of the Spirit to say, it ain't about what I want to do. It's not about what I want to do. Thy will be done. When when we get to that place, our prayer will know no limits. Ephesians 2, 4 through 6, Paul writing here says, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you saved, and hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The Spirit-led church is made up of born-again believers. And as a result of this new birth, we become spirit beings. Now, for some people, they're, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor. You're getting weird on us there. We think about spirit beings. I'm not saying that we're little gods. John 3 and 6 says, They which is born of the flesh, it's flesh. They which are born is born of the spirit. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. So once again, that doesn't mean that spirit beings does not mean that, uh, that we're little gods running around, but it does make us spiritual beings because of this. Uh, that's the only way that we can communicate with God. John 4, 24, God is a spirit and they to worship him, uh, worship him in spirit and in truth. We understand that that's the way God created man. That was the whole intentions of man. In Genesis chapter 2, We find that God had an intention, and he set things in place, but there was a fall that took place, and in that, men's spirit died towards God. And and we know that the devil brought Eve to question that in Genesis chapter 3. He said, what are you talking about? You're not going to die. You're not going to die. And even after they partook of the fruit of the tree that God said, leave alone, they didn't drop dead physically, but they did die spiritually. That communion was broken. 
He said this in Genesis 2, 16 and 7, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. Why? For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. What did it mean that they died spiritually? It meant that they no longer had the capacity to communicate with God. They were driven out of the garden, that paradise that God had prepared for them. They were cherubims put there with flaming swords to make sure to keep that tree, that no one would make that mistake again. And so they were placed there, and they were given what they asked for. They made the choice to follow after flesh, and God granted their request. He enforced their will. We said that if we will do the will of God, He will enforce that will in our life. But understand, too, if you choose the will of the flesh, God will enforce that will as well. He will let you do what you choose to do. So make sure that we choose wisely. So we understand that that's why we came to the need of needing to be born again of Jesus. Coming as that second Adam, that firstborn of a new creation on the spiritual side. Paul said it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And this new creature now is created in righteousness and in holiness. Righteousness and holiness. And, and in that, we have the ability now to communicate with God. We have That line has been drawn, has been reconnected, and we have that ability. It all comes. We have that ability to communicate with God, but with that ability comes responsibility. Comes responsibility. I always reference this, but... Larry Boy and VeggieTales. Anybody with kids knows who Larry Boy with VeggieTales is. Just has kids raised in church. But Larry Boy loved chocolate. And he said, with great chocolate comes great responsibility. And he's teaching our kids a lesson there on the spiritual side. He's saying to know that when we have a great love for something, when we have a great capacity for something, we have a great responsibility. He, he was saying there that he had to know the limitations of what to do and what not to do. But not only to know them, but to do them. So when we move in this responsibility that we have, we're empowered by the Holy Ghost to do the will of God. So we must be born again of the Spirit, filled with the Spirit. But we've got to live every day led by the Spirit. Whatever he says do, do it. Lord, what would you have me to do? He says it. Uh-uh. No, that won't work. Okay, Lord, I'll do it. Many people today, is, they don't have a problem asking the Lord what, they, what he would have them to do. Lord, what would you have me to do? Okay, I'll get to that when I can. Noah didn't do that. God said, here's the dimensions, build the ark. He got to work. Have we got to work? Are we being led by the Spirit and what He would have us to do? It's important to be Spirit-led. So in closing this morning, we are led and controlled. If we are led and controlled by the flesh, it's simple. We're going to be limited. We're going to be limited. We're going to be limited to the power of what the flesh can do. What is accomplished in our services will be only what the flesh can accomplish. Talent's only going to take you so far. Your ability to move people is only going to go so far. But on the other hand, if we're led and controlled by the Spirit, we're going to have the ability to think the thoughts of God and work the works of God. Understanding this morning that Christ is the head of the church and that we're the body. He didn't say that we are, as the church, are the head of Christ. He said we're the body of Christ. Why? Because Christ is already the head. What's found in the head? The mind. And so understanding that He is the body, He is the mind. He is the leadership. So therefore, this mind must be the mind of Christ. His mind must be the mind of the body. 
Christ can't be doing this, and we're doing this. And we've got to be operating in harmony with the Spirit of God. So we've got to understand that with His mind comes His ability. But with His ability, that leaves us with a responsibility. And I want to be Spirit-led, don't you? We're either going to be led by the Spirit or we're going to be led by the flesh. So as you stand with me this morning, understanding that, we've got one or two choices today. We're going to either be led by the Spirit or we're going to be led by the flesh. Going back to Romans chapter 8, backing up a few verses, the verse 6, we find this. you got a choice. I'm leaving you with a choice again this morning, just like I did last Sunday morning. Flesh or Spirit? You're either going to be led by the flesh or you're going to be led by the Spirit. I can't just leave you with that statement. i got to tell you the consequences of your decision. Here it is, Romans 8 and 6. To be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Seems like an easy choice, doesn't it? To be carnally minded is death. Death stinks, right? Nobody wants death. To be spiritually minded, we want life. Everybody's trying to tell you how to live your best life. The salt life, all kinds. You see those bumper stickers? There's people living all kinds of life. Out where I'm at, this the Cove life. Up in Middleburg, it's the Berg life. Whatever that means. Everybody's looking for life. Everybody wants peace. How many likes chaos? Only weird people like chaos. We're looking for peace. We want peace. We go on vacation because we want peace. We take breaks because we want peace. We're looking for peace. He said the best way to get that is to fall under the headship of Christ and to be spiritually minded. So this morning as we approach this altar, you just got to ask yourself this question this morning. Am I being spirit-led? Am I being spirit-led? Am I being obedient to the leading of Christ? buddy of mine many years ago got into what we would call a precarious situation. He accepted the invitation to come and pastor a church, a little independent church, only to find out after he got there to that church, wonderful church, and they had wonderful services, and he thought, man, this is great. But to find out, not by anybody telling him, but by God revealing it to him, that that church was a result of a split. And I don't know how, I can't remember how long it was into it, but God told him to tell that church that we're going back to wherever you came from before I got here. He said, I'm taking us back to that church. He said, and I'm going to not be the pastor, but I'm going to fall under the leadership of that pastor. That had to be a hard thing to do. That's what the Spirit said to do. Why? Because God said, I'm not about division, I'm about unity. And obviously that split, that the group that he was with, it split for carnal reasons, because the Spirit said. Amazingly, that group of people followed that leading. And that that was split and it was broken was brought back together. After a process of time, that brother found that God had a new place of ministry for him and opened up other doors for him. But it was in that season of his life because he was obedient that God used him to restore something that was broken by flesh. Don't ever question what God says. Do just do it. That's tough. That's hard. Follow the leading of the Spirit and you'll never go wrong. So I just want to ask you this morning as as I give this altar call, are you being obedient to the Spirit of God? If not, you have an opportunity to make that right in these altars this morning. To be able to say before you leave here today, not, Lord, where you lead, I will swallow. Lord, where you lead, I will follow. Not kicking and screaming, but willingly 
to be able to, to proclaim that what God said. I could stand before you today and not say boastfully, not saying boastfully that I'm a preacher of the gospel, an ordained bishop in the church of God. I don't stand and say that boastfully because titles never, ever mean anything to me. But I can say that I stand here today as a preacher of the gospel because God chose me to preach the gospel. Did I want to do it? No. Was I kicking and screaming for a little while? Absolutely. But when I quit kicking and screaming, can I tell you the best decision I ever made? Why? Because I was being spirit-led. Spirit-led. Your testimony can be much the same if you allow yourself to be led by the Spirit. So as I pray this morning, why don't you find you a place in this altar and just make do a checkup. Say, Lord, I want to make sure that I'm being led by your Spirit. Father, we love you. Thank you that you're always leading, that you're always guiding, that you're always showing us a better way. Father, God, help us to never choose our way. Help us to always choose your way. Help us to walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, operate in the Spirit. We can be led by your Spirit every day. As we gather around these altars this morning, draw us into your perfect will. We'll be careful to give you the praise and the honor and glory for it and live it out in Jesus' name.